that resides on Entebbe Road, also a Kiso district. And uh, this Mulindo Ivan defiled a seven year old girl. Hmm? Imagine seven years. And he was arrested. And because we have created rapport with various structures, the local one council of uh, Reza was quick to call out our free line and say, I have this case, how do you intervene? We intervened, moved to the chief magistrate's court that did what we call a uh, measuring of the case and transferring it to the high court. And in February, Ivan, uh, Ivan Trudy came through, February 2024, and he's in prison for 15 years. Of course, we wouldn't want to have people in prison. But if you go an extra mile to defile a seven-year-old and we have laws of this country, then the law will get with you. So Ivan is in prison for 15 years. And this is a case specifically stemming from Wakiso. And there are several other cases that we get that perhaps if you gave me a full day to discuss the cases from Wakiso, we would cry. We have one where the mother has uh, more children. I don't remember the number. But the father of those children has been defying them every single day. How he would get a benzene, we know benzene, and saucepans and place them near their bed where they sleep with wife. Why? So that the woman does not leave the bed and is not hearing what is happening in another room. So every time the woman would step down, the suspects would make noise and they would walk away from his children. And he's defiled the three so far. And this is our district, yes. Three so far. Your biological children. So I think issues of providing information really need to get there. Just imagine, you're in the house, I reached an extent and asked the woman, are you sure you have not denied this man sex? And she says, I will provide. But I don't know how he went to buy children. And the children are affected health-wise. Now this man is in prison and the woman is saying, I cannot even access food because he's the bread winner. And these are issues that we see in the communities. You cannot talk about life and you forget about food. You cannot talk about health and you don't talk about food. You cannot talk about housing and you forget right to a clean and healthy environment. All rights are interdependent and interrelated. Now, what does it require? And uh, I'm happy majority of the audience here students I have learned. What does it require to observe human rights? Ladies and gentlemen, whereas we have the institutional frameworks and the legal, it is the individual. Human rights are respected or violated from homes, from the markets, from offices, from, from the church, from the mosque, from the environment. And the, those who respect or violate are human beings. Therefore, what does it require? Mindset change, this aspect here. It begins with you. I want to use the words of uh, a scholar in the human rights-based approach, Urban Johnson. He says, in as far as possible, everybody should have a human rights heart in his or her actions. It is the, the husband of someone who violates the rights of a wife. It is someone's wife who violates the rights of a husband or the children. Having a family, I know that if I'm not happy, everybody in the family is not happy. I have, I, I have lived with this and I have seen it. If you are a husband and the head of a family and you are always peaceful, there will be peace in the home. When you abuse your wife, she also abuses the children and the children abuses the maid. The maid abuses the dog and the chain continues. So, protection and promotion of human rights starts with you as an individual. This is very important. Don't wait for the Uganda Human Rights Commission. 
Don't wait for the Wakiso District Human Rights Committee. Actually, if we did our part to prevent violations from happening, these institutions would have less work to do. They would be there because deviant behavior cannot entirely be eliminated, but at a very, very low magnitude. So I want to urge all of us who are here to be ambassadors in our homes, in our offices, because our actions translate into either respecting or violating human rights. Human rights is lived. It is life we live. It's not theory, it is practical. So if you choose to respect people's rights, society will be peaceful. If you choose to violate people's rights, society will be turbulent. That's why you see some people are posted in offices and the people fight that he or she should not be transferred. While others are rejected, and people raise petitions, whistleblowers say that you are removed. Ask yourself why. The difference is simple. It is your personal conduct that translates into stressing people or making people happy. I'm um, usually in the trainings and I ask people, are you the kind of officer, Madam District Prisons Commander, who your staff would be happy uh, to be with? Or they are now praying that today you are away and they are praying to wish if this meeting would last for one week. So that they, 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 are, they have some relative relief. I don't want answers. Think about yourself. You are headmaster of a school. Are you the kind of headmaster the school environment would miss? Or if you are away, everybody is happy. That should tell you whether you, are, uh, you respect human rights or you violate them. School students, university students, you are a guild president, you are a chairman of a human rights club, you have some authority, you become a problem to the society. We must change our way of conduct. Protection and promotion of human rights starts with the individual. Everybody should have a human rights act. Um, it is because of we who are duty bearers. You were vice chancellor, you were principal, you were headmaster, you were chief executive officer. Because you, 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 look, you look after the welfare of other people, what you do, what you do translates into respecting or violating the rights of the people. So I thought I should highlight that. The second point, which I did not come prepared to talk about, but because of the students who are here, I should also, I should also say Makere Oye. I was also a student here in 1998 to 2001. Yeah, so I'm back home. I was telling my driver since I left this university, I'd never come to the, this faculty here, given the fact that it is very far. But I knew that it is a place after leaving Stone Hall. Yeah, so, yeah, but I'd never come back here 25 years later. But I'm happy to be back home. But this is my message to the students. One of the the speakers, and I don't know if he, he, this was a student, talked about economic rights. University students, I'm telling you, take away the mentality that you want to finish Makerere, IU, IU, UCU, and begin looking for jobs. We are living in changing times. You must create the jobs by yourselves. Stop wasting money. I'm a parent, I give my children money, but I'm also trying to mentor them like what I'm telling you here. When they give you money when the semester has begun and there is food, maybe these days things have changed. I don't know if you, if you is there still food in the halls? It, it changed, I read about it. But whatever the case, 
you t use part of the money you've been given to invest. Don't wait for millions, don't wait for donors. You can buy a plot of land from the money you've saved from Makere here, and by the time you leave the university, that land, you know land is the most important factor of production. It has been talked about here. We know it very well. You cannot produce anything without land. That is a known fact. Even planes fly and park on land. You know, they park and land on land. So a, a land is a very, very important factor of production. Don't waste money. Any little money you get, think of how you can get more money. Let's get out of the mentality of looking for white collar jobs. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I have to confess that I've been hijacked quickly, so I had not come to attend to be on the panel, but I'll discuss that with the moderator later. <laughs> um, some years ago, as we set up the Uganda Human Rights Commission, we found that the commission can't reach everywhere. The commission was doing a lot of work. We started setting up regional offices, but then even the regional offices cannot reach everywhere. And then the other thing we thought about was the fact that each area has unique issues which have to be addressed. So we started thinking about different issues. Then we came up with the issue of the right to food, the right to health, and we were wondering how do we get this to permeate within the areas we've opened regional offices. Then we thought about setting up human rights committees within the institution, and by that time we wanted the officials, the government officials, to really spearhead getting district committees set up in their areas so that they can be able to do a lot. It never happened. We didn't set up the committees as quickly as we thought it would. And here we are now with the Human Rights Committee in Wakiso. Let's give them a big clap. I think, can you imagine having an idea and that idea is taken up by people? So we are very proud. I feel very proud to see the Wakiso Human Rights Committee. But what else do I wish for? that these committees get spread all over the country. Why spread? Because when you set up these committees, they reach out to those areas which might not be reached by the Uganda Human Rights Commission, regional offices, main office, and the committees can help to reach out those areas. So that's one thing. The other issue we took up was thinking about systematic issues. We talked about the right to health. And we even set up, again, a section or a department within the Uganda Human Rights Commission about the right to health. We came up with the right to food. And these were issues which really we thought we are very important and we thought that setting up sections within the commission will be very important. Do you know, during my time, we got the UN Special Rapporteur on the right to health visiting Uganda to come and actually actualize what we thought. That was a big achievement for us because as you know, most of the special reporters are very busy 
And also the government has to allow for the special rapporteur to come and visit the country. But we had a special rapporteur on the right to health coming. So you see the history of it. We got the right to food again a section in, within the commission. And we worked with different organizations. For the right to health, we worked with the Ministry of Health. And I hope you do yeah. work with the Ministry of Health to really actualize some of those issues. We were talking about the different diseases which are very difficult for people to conceptualize. And we thought working with the Ministry of Health will help us. So that was the history, the right to food, the right to health, getting special rapporteurs. Now we have a committee, which is a big achievement, and I will be glad to see more committees as I fight for Thank this you. struggle. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, now I bring in uh, advocate. Uh, you see the history. You've worked with the committee. I think uh, it is important that you add on uh, this success based on what we've done in committees, in, in the communities together. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Joseph Obang, I'm an attorney. I work with uh, Redemi International at the Wakiso office. Uh, basically, I'll give a brief of uh, what we do as an organization. Our mission is to protect widows and orphans from, first of all, violent abuse and also exploitation, uh, especially their land rights. Yes, so uh, we have closed the work with the Committee of Human Rights in Wakiso. And uh, we want to say that there are some of our key, key partners in us executing our mandate in Wakiso district. Uh, I will delve into today's theme uh, based on what we do by trying to just a position uh, what we do. Because for us, we're mainly working with land rights. What we do is uh, protecting vulnerable people. We believe that widows and orphans are the most vulnerable in society because uh, those are our target groups and those people, by the time you're a target group for us, we know you're missing someone, you're missing a head of a family, could be a spouse, uh, that makes you a widow, could be a parent. And uh, in Uganda here, uh, human rights are not only abused violently, most people think it's only assaults and these other things, but also people are exploited, people are not aware of their rights, and this is very common in Wakiso. Uh, realized that now, previously, Wakiso was more of a rural area. And the connection between uh, food and health. Uh, I will speak in a sense of the interdependency of human rights, uh, because like each right depends on each other. And without safe food, without nutritious food, you can't be healthy. Uh, recently, the past month, uh, we've seen that in the news, uh, we are fed with a lot of substances that people do not really understand or take time to dig deeper and understand what they are eating. I remember Del Monitor publishing about the transformer oils in the street foods that we eat. And here we have a number of students that we have here, and I know most of them consume these street foods. Uh, uh, the Uganda Human Rights Commission in 2018 also uh, made a report that most of the food we have here is, comp is compromised of substances, and uh, it's just because we do not have clear laws or regulations on the food. Whoever has food brings it to the market without any regulations. At the district level, uh, we go to get the uh, licenses to operate, but they do not look into all these issues of the public safety, uh, the safety of the food that these people are going to sell to the 
to the public. Uh, chair, about the success stories, I will start by still linking uh, our success story to to the people of Busi and other fishing areas in Wakiso, because we know part of Wakiso is attached to the lake, and one of the major economic activities within Wakiso, fishing is inclusive. However, we've had uh, a number of policies and regulations coming up for us, which we call the top to bottom policies, uh, where policies are made without consulting the stakeholders, the community members, the people that are affected, ending up uh, denying the people of their sole livelihood source. Uh, recently, we have regulations that are coming up on Mokene, and we know how nutritious Mokene is and its contribution to the health of the population. Uh, so, as Vian Uganda, or as partners, because I know we've not done independently, then this work together with the committee and the civil society partners here. Uh, we've tried to engage in advocacy to ensure that as these policies are formulated, the communities are engaged. On series of meetings and workshops with the ministry, we've had to ferry communities from Busi to come and at least have an input in these dialogues. Uh, we've empowered the communities to claim for their rights. Uh, recently, we had them inviting the leaders of the district and the members of and the member of parliament, at least to present to them uh, their plight. And a report was made uh, with an assurance from the member of parliament that at least it will be a basis uh, to discuss all these coming in policies on the fish. Thank yeah. you very. Much. Thank you, thank you, Shafiq. I think you bring in uh, good ideas there. And, and uh, out of that meeting, actually, we had at Busi with a member of parliament. I saw mm -hmm. recent the lead of opposition visiting highland places and also specifying the need to implement the aquatic law that was passed. So that advocacy we really appreciate. Thank you. Uh, we also uh, bring in Brother Eric. Brother Eric, uh, you've done a lot of work in. Um, advocating for the rights uh, of those marginalized groups. And um, I know you have lessons that you could share. And you're the one who has entirely read this report. And you, you know, you appreciate it and you have, you, you can at, at least able to discuss it. Can you please uh, tell us some of the things that you think would work better for us based on your uh, experience? Thank you. Uh, so greetings, everybody. I am uh, Eric Jackson. Uh, I'm a supporter of Roots Africa and uh, with an organization called Black Yield Institute back in the United States. And uh, first I say that reading the report um, and then hearing the keynote uh, address and so thank you very much for framing everything and the governor for sharing some of the, the national issues. And my first analysis in, in all of that, reading the report and all, is that the people who are creating these conditions, whether they be elected officials or um, you know, upper class people, they must have learned how to do it from the same place. Because it seems that in the United States of America, at least where I'm from, we have some of the same kind of issues. And so I don't know where people are learning how to govern uh, or learning how to deal with people, but it sounds like it's coming from the same place. And so for us, our approach to human rights back home addressing food and land issues is uh, related to when we think about social determinants of health, right, or those drivers of health. One of the key pieces that we think are important, which was brought in in our uh, last panelist, uh, uh, said about making sure that the people's voices are in the conversation about policy uh, to include legislation, technical assistance, and, uh, and so much more. Um, because we know that it impacts people directly. The issue that we are finding 
um, back home is that if when people do not have access to good food, even if food is coming through food charity or food aid, um, 